Hello there friends and welcome, for today's BG3 guide we have a return to companion builds. Although this can also work for the main character, but anyways we'll be going with Karlak the Tifling. We'll of course be keeping her as a barbarian with a twist. This Karlak will be quite competent at Throwmancy, that's right, capable of fully exploiting thrown weapons to the max. With many powerful ranged attacks, each with a very good damage stack of multiple sources, and the best part, of course, full synergy with the highly powerful Tavern Brawler feat for even higher damage and attack rolls. Another great part about this build is that even early game it will be quite competent, right? Because most of the throne supporting gear can be found as early as Act 1. And of course it will only get better and better from there. With more attacks and more damage too. To the point that even if you want to conserve your Frenzy and Rage users, you'll still be able of quite a lot of attacks with nice damage. So without further ado, let us get into our Karlak Throwmancer build. First with character creation. Now as I said, this build can also work for the main character. And as far as race, Karlak already has one of the best races in the game anyways, the Zeriel Tiefling, right? Which provides her with extra smite abilities for higher damage, at level 3 and also level 5. It's just that they cannot be used with thrown weapons, right? It's either melee or ranged. And well, your thrown weapons can be used at melee range too if you want. The build is versatile enough for that. Other than that, if you want to go with the main character, there's always the classic wood elf for higher movement, the same with half elf, and gift for some unique abilities like teleport. Mostly that. But tiefling is good enough. For ability scores, We'll just change them a bit, right? It's still going to be mostly the default Karlak. 17 strength, after all, thrown weapons work based on this, not dexterity, for both attack rolls and damage. And they have amazing synergy with the Tavern Brawler feat we'll get later on, that also works based on double your strength modifier, quite good. Besides that, you can choose between either 16 dexterity and 14 constitution, or the opposite, right? 14 dexterity and 16 constitution. I'd rather dexterity because barbarians are quite tanky, right? They have high hit points and also rage to get physical resistance. Plus, dexterity means higher initiative. As a ranged character, I find it best that Karlak starts with decent enough initiative scores. But you can just swap between dexterity and constitution if you prefer. And as far as the leftover point, you can just go with wisdom, for example. Or charisma if you want to use her as the main face of your party to intimidate enemies. For the main character, if you want to receive Aunt Yethel's boon for plus 1 to strength for free, you can also leave constitution at 15 so that you increase it through the Tavern Brawler feat later to 16, as your strength would already be 18 for free, right? Now as far as skills, she actually already comes with great ones, athletics, because of her high strength. I would also leave intimidation because I think it fits her character, right? It's not exactly necessary. Other than that, it's up to you. I'd pick Perception, because there's a lot of Perception checks, you know, detect traps, find secrets and so on. Alright, for the second level, I'll explain some of the Barbarian class features now, but most importantly, this is when you get Reckless Attack, which can proc advantage on all of your attacks at the cost of enemies having advantage on you as well. Not that much of an issue with Barbarians, because they are Rage, right? Their main ability will make you fully resistant to physical attacks, that is, 50% damage taken, both melee and ranged. So in a way, you kinda make up for enemies having advantage on you. Sadly, this will not work on ranged attacks, unless you attack with a melee weapon first, including thrown weapons, right? So you have to go melee first, which I find a bit troublesome for a ranged build, but you can do it if you want. The build is versatile enough for that anyways, your melee attacks will also hit for nice amounts. Barbarians also have the Danger Sense ability, right, for advantage on dexterity saving throws, mostly against spells. At level 3 we get to choose Karlak's subclass as a Barbarian, and what we want is Berserker, no doubt. It fits her, right, character-wise, but most importantly, it will make your Rage become Frenzy. It's exactly the same, except you'll also get to use Frenzied Strike and Enrage Throw. The main difference is that these are both bonus actions, right? So you can both attack with your normal action and a bonus action. Especially useful because of the Enrage throw ability, right? Which will work with your thrown weapons as well. And don't forget, this is when you get your first Thiefling Smite spell. 
Now we want to keep progression into Barbarian until we get our extra attack. And for a feat at level 4, well, it doesn't need anything. Tavern Brawler, no doubt. I've already explained in depth how this works in my Monk Guide, you can check to the side here, but to put it simply, it doubles your Strength modifier to both attack and damage brawls, including with thrown weapons. It really is amazing. And of course, increased strength here. Level 5 is when we get our extra attack as a Barbarian, which is great, together with fast movement, just like Monk, except we can't be wearing heavy armor, it's only up to medium. And the last Tiefling spell, for Radiant damage now. For level 6, I would rather multiclass our Karlak, because Barbarian won't really offer that much above level 5. And to me, Rogue is the way to go at first, just like my Monk build right, because both the Monk class and a Throwing Barbarian have a lot to gain by having multiple bonus actions, because like I said, you can use the Enrage Throw ability from Frenzy as a bonus action. And Rogue Thief will provide that very soon. Also, Sneak Attack will work with your thrown weapons, which is very fun. And remember, you don't have to actually choose the action to use the sneak attack, right? So long as the enemy is viable, that is, for example, you have advantage on them or is hiding, your sneak attack will be applied automatically. Rogue will also let you enhance some of your skills, and I would just go with Intimidation, as I think it fits Karlak, together with Perception. The order is up to you. Acrobatics can help too, since we already have high ranks. And there's always Stealth too. For level 2 Rogue, don't forget we can also hide and dash as bonus actions. For level 8, we can finally enter the Thief subclass for the extra bonus action, amazing as it means, well, an extra thrown attack when raging. Now, for level 9, you have two options. You can keep progression as Rogue, as to get an extra feat and ideally ability improvement strength, right? For the maximum possible from leveling up. Or you know, you can just use the elixirs that set your strength to either 21 or 27, 21 being from the huge giant elixir, very easy to acquire even early game, from the dwarven vendor at the underdark Myconid colony. It's just that it will prevent you from using the elixirs of bloodlust for the extra attack whenever the enemy is killed, it's up to you what you prefer. Of course if you're going with the elixirs of strength, well there's no point in increasing your strength further, in which case I would rather multi-class now, as sadly, both sharpshooter or Great Weapon Master, well, they won't work with thrown weapons for higher damage. And as far as multiclassing, something fun you can do is get two levels into Druid and Spore Druid. So that all of your ranged attacks will now have an extra 1d6 necrotic damage. While it only works while you have temporary hit points and you only have 8 with two Druid levels from the Symbiotic Entity ability, you are a ranged character, right? So it's not like enemies will be attacking you much. Or you can also get started into two levels of Fighter now, for the Action Surge bonus ability, right? So you get even more attacks on demand. I'll just continue with Rogue myself, so I can use the Elixirs of Bloodlust, instead of having to rely on the Strength granting ones. But I've given you other options. And of course, Strength to 20. Now you want another multiclass. And ideally, in this case, if you went to 4 levels of Rogue, 2 levels into Fighter now, more like 3, so we can increase our critical range. Otherwise, if you went with 2 Druid, you would after that get 2 levels into Fighter. It's pretty simple. You might as well pick Defense here, I don't think Great Weapon Fighting will work with your Throne Weapons. Maybe I tested it wrong, but it wasn't working for me. If it does, feel free to pick it, however. So just go with Defense. We'll get our very useful Action Surge at level 2 Fighter, which by the way, can grant you 2 extra attacks. It's only once per short rest, but good enough. And lastly, 3 levels into Fighter, for the Champion subclass of course, for even higher critical range. But as I said, you can also go with 5 Barbarian, 3 Rogue, 2 Spore Druid, and 2 Fighter. Alright, now let us get into gear for our Karlak Throw Mancer. For the helmet, ultimately you have two choices. First, the horns of the berserker, because so long as you are not at full health, which is very easy to achieve by, you know, just having a companion punch you for one damage, you'll get an extra two necrotic damage on hit. And as I said before, we'll get to stack loads of extra damage on our thrown weapon attacks. 
Second, you'll get a plus 2 to hit creatures that are not at full health. Although this isn't that important because, well, we have Tavern Brawler to maximize our 2 hit chances anyway, even as early as level 4. Besides that, you can also use Saravok's Horn Helmet for the extra bonus to critical range. But as medium armor, it will reduce your AC. Although you know it doesn't matter much for this Karlak because she is a ranged character overall, even if she can go melee. And besides that, your Rage and Frenzy will make you take half damage from physical strikes anyways, including ranged attacks. Earlier you can also use the Covert Cowl, once again because of the range advantage, as just like Seravox's Helm, it will increase your critical range. For the Cloak, there aren't really any good early game ones, I'm afraid, at least not for this type of build. And I'd say you have two choices. The Mantle of the Holy Warrior for the Crusader Mantle spell, although you can just have a War Cleric cast it on you. In any case, it will grant your whole party 1 to 4 extra radiant damage, which can help a lot, right? Especially considering how many attacks per round you'll have. Even better if you have other party members with many attacks too. Besides that, the Shade Slayer cloaks so that whenever you're hiding, your critical range will be increased. And well, we have the range advantage, so hiding is pretty easy with this type of build. Sadly, both of these cloaks are Act 3 only. For armor, you have a few different options. You can of course go with up to medium armor, as barbarians are proficient in that. It will just tank your AC by removing the bonus from unarmored defense. I like the Enraging Heart garb, so that whenever you're raging, you automatically get a plus 2 to your damage. It even increases your constitution by plus 2 as well, for a maximum of 20. You might also prefer the Bone Spike garb, which makes so that you gain 15 temporary HP whenever you rage, and also reduces incoming damage by 2, which is very powerful when combined with, well, the resistance you already get from raging, right? So it's like having two sources that reduce damage taken. There's a mighty cloth too for plus 2 to strength, but the maximum is 20, and at the point you get this, you'll probably already have it by virtue of leveling up. For gloves, ultimately held those gloves for the extra 1 to 6 fire damage on hit. But early game, for most of the game to be fair, because Helldusk is Act 3 only, be sure to go with the gloves of uninhibited Kushigo, as they will add an extra 1d4 damage with thrown attacks, and you can find it very early too, Act 1 even. For boosts, I'd say you have two choices. The Disintegrating Nightwalkers can help, you can find it pretty early too, at the Underdark by defeating True Soul Nair, and it will provide you with Misty Step once per short rest, which can help this type of character, because since we have the range advantage, we even get bonuses with thrown weapons by attacking from high ground, well, you'll get to teleport as a bonus action to whatever you want, including high elevations, which helps with tanking too, or at least avoiding hits. Besides that, there's something to be said about the speedy light feat. Whenever you dash, you'll get three lightning charges. This will increase your attack rolls and damage by a bit. And since we have rogue levels, you'll be able to dash with the use of a bonus action. For amulets, mostly the amulet of greater health, it's act 3 only, but you know, setting your constitution to 23 is huge. And there's a classic amulet of Misty Step as well for the same benefit as the boots. And you can always use the Surgeon Subjugation Amulet as well to guarantee paralyzation against any humanoid target, like most bosses to be fair, on a critical hit. For rings you have a few different options. The Risky Ring of course is the best in slot for any ranged or melee character. Having advantage on all of your attacks is amazing. While it is true that a Barbarian can generate advantage at will through the use of their Reckless Attack ability, well, this only works for melee, so you have to attack at melee first to then get the bonus with your thrown weapons. And I'd rather attack from range myself. Together, of course, with increasing your critical hit chance. Now, you might prefer to have this on the main character or someone else, right? So here's what you can do, you can also equip the Caustic Band found very early at the Underdark Merchant, the same one you go for your elixirs, including the Strength Elixirs, right, the Dwarven Lady, at the Myconid Colony, and anyways, this will grant you an extra 2 acid damage, which can help with your damage stacks. Don't forget the Kalos Glow Ring, also for 2 points of extra damage this time, as Radiant. Last but not least, however, you definitely want the Ring of Flinging, right? You can be found pretty early, and well, you'll get an extra 1d4 bonus to thrown damage. Now let us cover weapons and quick slots. 
4 weapons, very early game, the best choice you have, even up to Act 2, to be fair, is the Returning Pike. Which means, of course, you don't have to pick it up after you throw it. And like I said, you can get it super early by buying it from the main Goblin Trader at the Goblin Camp area. You can easily rush there, even at Tactician mode, with minimal battles. But later for Act 3, we'll want, of course, the legendary throne weapon. Nairuna, a trident, by the way. It's quite stacked in what it does. First, when thrown, it will actually generate an area of effect explosion around the target, right? For 3 to 12 thunder damage. Considering how many times you can throw this per round, and well, each attack will generate an explosion, it's very good. Especially when you combine it with the Cold of Weak Mind Flayer power. It even increases your movement and jumping distance, together with immunity to falling damage. Together with already having an extra plus 1d6 thunder damage on hit, right? It's thunder for both the normal strike and the area of effect ability. Lastly, it will illuminate everything around you in a pretty big radius. Just be careful because it will clash with, for example, the covert call, right? Since it does require you to be obscured. But by the point you get it, it doesn't matter, you can just use Saravox Helm anyways. This will come from the Genie quest at the Circus during Act 3. Now, while it is true you can equip other main hand weapons, for example, the Knife of the Under Mountain King to increase critical range, because the thing is, you can throw the weapon itself just by having it on your inventory, right? It doesn't have to be on your main hand. The problem is, once you throw it once, it will automatically replace whatever weapon you had equipped. So, to be fair, the critical range boost and other passive boosts are only gonna work for the first attack. I mean, you can do it if you want, I just find it a bit micromanagement heavy. And just for a fun note, you can also use the classic Dwarven Thrower weapon, which by the way comes straight from Baldur's Gate 1. It's just that... well, you can only get it during Act 3, which is exactly the same as when you could get Nairona, which I find better, right? The Dwarven Thrower has the unique benefit of increasing its damage, so long as you are a Dwarf. And well, you can just use the Disguise Self spell for that. Even on Karlag by using the Mask of the Shapeshifter. It will even deal more damage if the enemy is large, huge or gargantuan, but usually you fight humanoids which tend to be the same size as you. I'm just saying you can use it if you want, right? But not going to be as useful as the Trident. As far as our range slot, the classic Darkfire Shortbow to add haste and of course resistance to cold damage as Karlak herself is already resistant to fire damage by virtue of being a tiefling. But ultimately, as always, the dead shot to increase critical range further because once again, unlike other builds, we can't really access our main and offhand with critical range boosting weapons. And now I'm always up for more fun gear suggestions, please be sure to comment them down below. Lastly, when it comes to consumables, the Elixir of Bloodlust is probably the best choice for this character, right? You'll gain an extra action upon killing an enemy, very easy to do with this build, and this extra action can even result in two attacks, together with five temporary HP upon enemy death too. It's only once per turn, but since it lasts until the long rest, well, it's quite OP, to be fair. On the other hand, you can ignore the Elixir of Bloodlust and go instead for the Elixirs of Strength, such as Cloud Giant later during Act 3, which will set your strength to 27, a massive amount. This can help because... Well, the Tavern Brawler feat will increase both your damage and attack rolls with thrown weapons by double your strength modifier, right? And I didn't want to dump Karlak's strength, as I don't think it would be in character at all, right? Because after all, if you're just going to be using the Elixir, there's also the Hill Giant variant you can get even early game for 21 strength. Well, why bother increasing strength at all, right? I wanted my Karlak to remain as muscular as she appears to be, right? Well, alright friends, so this was it for my Karlak Trollmancer build and guide. If you found it useful, as always, please remember to like, subscribe and consider becoming a channel member too if you can. I really appreciate your support. Thank you for watching and see you next time, friends.